Well, this is going to be difficult. Uh, in this video, I wanted to talk about my experiences and ongoing struggles with anxiety, mental health issues, and past family traumas. So I'm doing this partially because keeping it inside is just this kind of toxic weight. And uh, I really just need to get it out <laughs> in, in one respect and to be able to move on with my life. So I'm going to do that in this video, even though it makes me feel very vulnerable and exposed. But I'm also making this because this is not something that's talked about very often, even though it seems to be something that in my experience with the people that I know is very common. So I'm making this maybe because it might be helpful to somebody else out there to, to share my experience. I'm not sure who will watch this to the end, but uh, if you do, <laughs> maybe it resonates with you, some part of my story. And if it does, I hope that it's helpful to you in some way. Okay, so I'm gonna be reading off my notes just to make this a bit easier. Um, how did I get here to be making this video right now? I've had, I have a family history of mental health issues and I've also had a history with, or struggles with mental health in the past since, uh, since childhood. So for me, the form these took were depressive episodes and I've had a couple and depression, for me, how would I describe it? How it feels like? First of all, everything feels more difficult. It's like the air around you is just pressing in on you a little bit. And and you just it's harder to resist. It's harder to move through the air that you live in. Mentally, everything, the same things that you'll see when you're not depressed, when you are, everything just takes this darker tone. It's like there's some aspect of, for me, it's like there's some aspect of, evil to things. You can see the evil in things. Um, I learned to identify when I was actually having a depressive episode or when I was in a depression because it li literally the things that, it, that you see, they, the meaning changes, the, the tone of it all changes. And so the last time that I had, I would say that I had depression, which was just after my mom passed away uh, in 2020 or 2021, sorry, I was in Sydney and I remember I was walking, I was in some like so some beautiful part of Sydney by the water. And I think I was just sitting in a park, like looking up at the clouds. It was a beautiful day, sunny with like sort of passing white clouds, fluffy clouds. And I just remember looking at those clouds and seeing the shapes and the shapes that I saw, the images that I saw were like, it just filled me with like dread and terror. I, I can't remember what it was. It was like monsters and demons and things like that. Maybe it's, it's not always so, so, so evil. <laughs> a lot of the time it's just like, you just can't be bothered. You can't be fucked. You think, you know, so what? And like, why should I? What's the, what's the point? And there's just this kind of emptiness inside, a lack of interest, let's say. But to be honest, all of these, I've had four depressive episodes, four times that I've been through depression, and they've always been relatively mild. Again, I, I have other experience seeing depression in other people, people that are close to me. And um, I would call everything that I've gone through pretty mild in comparison. So after a few months, like maximum, like six months, I'd pull myself out of it and just, you know, move on with life. So that's my experience with depression and, and mental health, the, the primary mental health issue that I've had throughout since my, let's say early teenage years uh, until now coming and going. But that's not actually the reason why I'm here making this video, or it's not the thing that I'm struggling with at the moment. What I really wanted to describe and to share with you is my experience with anxiety and anxiety attacks because this is something that's relatively new to me at least to this severity and it's uh it's definitely something that's knocked me off my feet unexpectedly so i used to say that i have an anxious personality i'd say like you know my, my mind's always racing i'm an anxious person um i used to say that and what did that mean previously what that meant was that really my mind latches onto things. So it can be, it doesn't have to be something bad necessarily. For example, you know, when I had my Amazon business or when I was doing YouTube previously, when I started this project, first of all, I would just not really ever stop thinking about it. And so that's fine <laughs> to get stuff done, but when you want to go to sleep, it's, uh, it, it makes that hard. Not necessarily that bad. There are definitely positives to that kind of anxious thinking, which is just really like obsessive, I guess. Um, obviously, those are the positive examples. Those are the, the constructive examples, pardon me. So you can latch onto things that are negative or that you can't control and that becomes an, an issue. But for me, for most of my, I don't know when this started, it's just something that developed since my adolescence, I suppose. But that was really it. That was what I called anxiety for a long time uh, until 
I don't know when in this, uh, in this last year, maybe, uh, I started to have anxiety attacks. So this is what an anxiety attack for me feels like. Um, it's like inside your mind, your, your brain or like your thought, you know, your internal dialogue, which is how you think, right? It's the voice that's inside your head that's always talking. That is just like a record. And then something gets that record stuck on repeat. And so your thoughts, your internal monologue, dialogue, you basically just starts looping around and around over and over and over again. And you can sort of see the switch because it's you're, you're still there, you're still thinking, but the switch is kind of like just out of reach. And so you're just stuck in this loop. And 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 so it'll be focused on something. And anxiety is, is, is directional, it's about something. And uh, when that happens, you you, first of all, you feel really helpless because your mind and your ability to think for most people, at least for me up until now, has been something, it's been something that I've always taken for granted. Um, so the helplessness starts and that starts to make it worse because you start to feel locked in a little bit. Um, your heart pounds and, and you can really feel because you're sort of, locked, again, you're still conscious, I can still look around, but I, I really can't like talk to people. I can't really comprehend what's happening in the outside world. What I can comprehend is the noise of my beating heart. And that's just like this really strong, like pounding, pounding sound. And maybe that's because the heart rate, it, my heart's actually beating faster, probably. Um, and some of it's just perception, I think, because the, the volume from the outside world turns down <laughs> and then the volume of what's inside your head turns up and like drowns everything else out. So I'd say that, it's like you, your perception just collapses. You, you can't be present. You're, you're, you're basically completely distracted. And, and because your mind, your actual thinking is stuck in this loop, you, you can't, or I personally can't think my way out of it. So you start to feel this sense of panic, which again is it's around this danger that's outside in the world that you're supposed to react to and get away from, you know, either fight or flight or freeze, I guess. But the danger is inside so there's, there's nothing there's no way that you can focus that energy in a healthy way so yeah there's just nothing you can do about this thing and you have no really very little sense of agency and control in the matter again even because your thoughts are being hijacked by themselves by nothing i don't know it's just like the system is broken so it's very debilitating um and demoralizing because when you're in the moment you you can be around people and it it's really like uh painful i guess I don't know the <laughs> painful, scary. It's very scary because you can see it, but you can't stop it, at least not in the moment. So that's what an anxiety attack feels like. One of the hardest things, and this is the reason why I'm filming this video now, is feeling that way is one thing, but then trying to pretend that you don't feel this way to other people and to the world. Basically pretending that or like trying to not acknowledge that you feel fucked up inside makes it a lot, lot harder. <laughs> That's been, I think, one of the most difficult things for this as part of this whole challenge, this whole ordeal. And I'm good at this. I'm good at actually sharing and being vulnerable. It's, I mean, it's a skill that I've been learning. Being able to actually talk about it in this way um, is, a, is a big deal for me, actually. And so I wanted to talk about treatments and just like, how have I been healing, let's say, how have I been healing and recovering through this process? What's worked for me and what hasn't worked for me? The first thing is what I just said, not pretending. Don't pretend, for, I'm gonna speak to myself here. Don't pretend everything's okay when it's not okay. I know that, like I just said, having to put on that brave face, thinking that you actually have to do that, 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 that people will judge you if you can, can be vulnerable, uh, is going to make things a lot worse. And so in my case, I'm immensely grateful that I have enough close people around me who I can lean on and, and say, hey, I, I'm not okay. So not pretending has really been helpful and liberating um, throughout this process. Next, time in nature. <laughs> this is like the best bang for the buck for me. So I currently live in a city, in an apartment, and I have been finding with 100% reliability that getting out of the city, getting out of my home and just getting somewhere where there's nature, it's been the single most like easy, cheap, yet powerful and reliable treatment for me. 
uh, it's just something about specifically with anxiety, how I was describing it before, where the, the outside world just loses its, it loses its ability to get into your inside world. But the first moment that I feel, and I felt this last weekend, because I went into the mountains, like feeling that fresh breeze on your skin and just the sound of birds in the background, that like instantly breaks me out of it. I think time in nature is something that, you know, evolutionarily speaking, that's the environment we're supposed to be in. We're not supposed to live in cities as, as human beings, I mean. So when I'm out there, when I get out there, it's like that background noise just fades. The anxiety is literally gone straight away. Uh, I'm finding it works to just have overnight stays if I stay, you know, a night, two nights in just like this a little lodge or a little house out in the in the in the jungle, in the forest, in the mountains, wherever else. That's time in nature, super important for me. Uh, the next has been therapy. So seeing a therapist, seeing a psychologist, and specifically cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. I I'm fairly sure, now I'm not an expert, I'm not a psychologist, but I'm fairly sure it's the most common type of therapy, like modern therapy. And so if you go and speak to a therapist or a counselor or whatever, they're probably gonna be doing CBT. So my experience with therapy, it's been sporadic. I recognize that I probably should see one when my mum passed away. So that was for, for the grieving process. And like I said, I was in a, a mild depression. Um, I found that just seeing the right therapist, so being able to pick a therapist, I'm not gonna go into the whole process, everything here, but like uh, go into psychology today, if you wanna look at and find one, you can find them throughout the world. They do online, obviously, or in person. Have a call with a few and then find the one that fits best with you. The one that you feel the most uh, heard and understood that's probably the one you should go with because they'll teach you one like specific technique or one specific method and then that thing will really help you so for me and with anxiety uh using a worry diary so that is like the habit of i mean i'm already a let's say compulsive journaler i've been journaling for more than a decade regularly with almost like daily frequency and that helps a lot that can actually take most of the place of a therapist at least again my experience and that's why i haven't really had to have I felt the need to have many therapy sessions um, because I can have that dialogue with myself. But you need, or it really helps to have the frameworks, the models to use. And you can Google them, but it's it just feels much nicer when, uh, when somebody is working through those problems with you. A professional, right, who has knowledge in the area. But so specifically for anxiety, I found the worry diary to be very, very helpful. And so I just keep a paper notebook by my bed because I know that's when it gets worse. And so having this worry diary format, which again, you can Google it if you're interested, um, but basically like it really does allow you to just get that thing out of your head. You put it on paper following a specific process or these specific prompts. And generally after that, I sleep straight away. So depending on your budget and if you can afford one or you have like insurance or something to pay for a therapist, I really recommend it. I know a lot of people who have mental health issues and I also know that most of those people, as in that I personally know, don't go out and see a therapist. And I understand that because I dragged my feet on it for literally years. But if you're having problems, you don't feel good and you are resonating with something that I'm, that I'm saying in this video, I really just recommend going and trying it once or twice. Not once, because it depends on the therapist. If you don't like it the first time, try again with a different therapist and try that maybe like three times. And I think you'll find it valuable. Again, if you can afford it, if not, even if you can, journaling is also very helpful, but try and be very conscious and directed about how you journal. So the prompts that you use and the line of thinking and the line of questioning that you wanna be giving yourself, it should be for therapy purposes. Psychedelic medicines and specifically ayahuasca. I'll talk about this more in another video. For now, I'll just say that it has helped me find uh, spirituality. I'm on the pathway to finding purpose, but it has really opened my mind to a lot of good and I think, although I'm feeling anxiety and having these anxiety attacks a lot more than I would like to be, and a lot more than I previously was, things like ayahuasca and experiences and, and, and other things that I've been doing on the other side when I'm not anxious or like to control it, have really, I think, allowed me to have a lot more of an appreciation for the richness of life and, and our human experience, the life that we live. I don't wanna push it in this video or talk too much about it, but if it sounds like something that you'd be curious about, it is, or has been in my experience, ayahuasca and probably other psychedelics or sort of, what do you call them? Yeah, psychedelic medicines have been, uh, in my experience, helpful for anxiety. Meditation, uh, I found it helps, but it doesn't help that much. There's a, a reference from the Huberman lab. I don't have the exact like quote here, but I believe he says that basically if your natural tendency 
to be is to be inwards focused or introverted which is in you're going to turn inwards by default rather than outwards to the world which is extroversion then you probably want to train the opposite which is to go outwards so for me that's like getting out and doing sport that's like you're looking outwards into the world you're focused outwards on the world whereas meditation again you're 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 inside your head because anxiety is is like extremely being stuck in your head it it doesn't necessarily like sometimes i find it calming and grounding but sometimes i just find that it gives me anxiety <laughs> so it helps but it doesn't help that much the last thing is pattern interrupts so i mentioned this before with depression but just having some way of breaking yourself out of this repeating loop getting your brain to focus on something external something that's like dynamic and unpredictable which means that you can't you, you know you look away you miss something so your brain will will stick to that even though i haven't been i've been withdrawing socially generally I've actually found that going to a bar and listening to live music, like having a beer, super, super helpful. Just kills the anxiety, dead. So funnily enough, the way that I actually got to the what I think are the origins of my anxiety, that story actually begins with my stomach. Um, so I've had gut issues since I was a child, but sort of getting worse over time. So it used to just be when I was a kid, it was just some intolerances. I would throw up a lot. Um, I just, you know, like, it just would say that I had a sensitive stomach. As I got older into my 20s and particularly late 20s, started to develop into something that would actually start to become more and more of an issue when I was traveling or just like in day-to-day well-being. Nothing that was killing me, but like more and more uncomfortable and, uh, and, and painful from time to time. I was trying to treat my gut issues using a very sort of medical focused thing. It's like pills or dietary changes, antibiotics, things like that. that focus my focus changed when i read this book which is a very good book if you have gut issues the mind gut connection and i learned a couple of things from this book first of all how connected the body is to the mind and vice versa it's a two-way street maybe that's obvious but at the same time it's not actually obvious when you go and interact with the medical system for example so i learned that a lot of physical health issues in my case gut Uh, In other people, it could be skin, it could be joint issues, arthritis, things like that. Basically, everywhere else in your body, a lot of that ill health or health issues that are physical manifestations actually have either a a causal or at least a correlation with mental ill health as well. The origins of that connection and the the connection of ill health from physical to from body to mind, that goes all the way back to childhood, which is where a lot of it is actually fixed. Uh, so the issues that you have later in life come from your very early life not only that they actually come from before you were born so your mother um, and when you're in the womb and even before your mother was pregnant so this is actually your mother's life and this touches on the section that i wanted to talk about around family trauma and intergenerational trauma so my mom and her family they left cambodia to escape the khmer rouge uh, which was a genocide in the 70s So they came to Australia. I was born in Australia. I had no experience with what actually happened to my mom's side of the family. So my mom never told me anything about that experience of of living there, of having to leave in the process of leaving uh, as refugees from the genocide. She never told me anything. And actually the only, I only started to learn about it through my family uh, actually at her funeral and I still don't I can't say that I know what that was like for them at all I have no idea but I do understand now that her experience the things that she went through throughout that uh, process they changed her for the rest of her life and I I guess experienced as I was growing up as her son um, as one of her children the after effects the ripples if you will um of what happened to her i have come to accept and come to understand and realize that my life and my achievements and the things that i've shared with with you on this youtube channel more or less were a series of attempted escapes from the reality (laughs) of what that childhood was like And that's not to say that it was a bad childhood. I think you'll understand me if I say that most of what we do as human beings relates to love, the love of our parents, uh, seeking that love, desiring that love, and desiring to love back, to be able to love back. 
and to do that in a healthy way. Whether we're able to do that, to, to, to give the love, to receive that love, that's another question. And I was running away from that for my whole life, basically. Uh, and, and most of the things that I did in the Amazon business that I started, it wasn't the objective that I wrote down when I was doing this or when I was starting this YouTube channel. But thinking about my personal reasons behind them, there is one reason. And it was to, to make things better for, for, for her and for both of my parents, for my family, actually. And I was unable to do that. And then I think what happened was when I stopped posting on YouTube, it was because I sold my business. And when I did that, I stopped the direction that I was running in. I just stopped running. And when I stopped running, the void <laughs> caught up to me. The thing that I was trying to escape from, my inability to, to, to give and receive love, to be loved and to love in the way that you know every child wants, literally like the child inside you, which, which stays with you throughout your life. Uh, that was the thing I was running from, and then I had to face it. And uh, in short, I think that's why I'm, I feel pretty fucked up at the moment, is that I'm going through that and actually facing the thing that I have never had to face before in my life. So I didn't use the key word, which is trauma. So I didn't experience trauma. Uh, my mother did. And that was passed down to me through two mechanisms. I'm not going to explain this in too much detail, but I really, really recommend this book for a lot of people that I know, the body keeps the score. Uh, it is about how trauma works, how it affects people, as in mechanistically, how it affects your mind and your body. And therefore, what can you do to actually heal that trauma? And reading these books and other books and the journey that I've been through while just trying to, first of all, manage my own first, firstly physical symptoms and then mental health symptoms Behind that, I have discovered so much about how much of what we do is just driven by traumas and things that we may be never, never even experienced ourselves. It doesn't completely determine your fate. You have the ability to still make changes, but uh, a lot of those pathways are actually closed after your early life. And sometimes, you know, it's a it's a shit hand that the shit hand wasn't even dealt to you. It was dealt to your to your parents, to your mother, most specifically in terms of genetic pathways. These things being passed down. Intergen intergenerational trauma, but you can still do a lot. And the education is the first step. Actually being aware of these things. Again, I just kind of show this one more time. If you know someone or you are affected by trauma or have been affected by trauma, please get that book, please read it. Because this stuff stays inside you until you can find a way to get it out. Firstly, you have to acknowledge it, be conscious of it, and then do the really hard work to try and fix yourself up and make yourself better. So that's what I'm doing, facing reality. And uh, it's an exhausting process physically and mentally, but I think it needs to be done. What have I learned? Compassion, first and foremost. We are all fucked up inside. Again, like I said, we all have those scars. It's just a matter of how many, where they are, how deep they go, and whether we can admit that we have them or not. We all have our demons, we all battle against them, whether or not we're even aware of it, but we can't see what that struggle is like for anyone else. So you don't know what fight they're going through and uh so just have compassion be kind second thing is hurt people hurt other people again one of the most impactful books that i've read um nobody very few a very basically nobody does bad things to other people deliberately bad things happen because bad things were done to that person uh and that just links with compassion just understanding that Everyone is a little frightened child inside. I know I am. It's just that most of us don't know that. I didn't know that until going through this whole process. Humility. I definitely don't have it all figured out. I have spoken a few times about that inner child and I'm just really aware of that right now. I'm that vulnerable, scared little child that just wants to be loved. And that's inside me and it's always going to be there. Death. I didn't talk too much about grief or death but i've just realized i mean this story is tied up with my mother and her death and death is part of life i've realized that it is the cycle of life is death death is life life is death it's uh something that we all have to go through spirituality i touched on that i never would have called myself spiritual just a few years ago but uh 
specifically ayahuasca has helped, but also I think just going through life shit and being open to it and being aware of it, I feel like it inevitably sends you down some kind of spiritual journey, whether it's religion, whether it's your God, whatever it is that you believe. I think we probably all need something that fills that role and gives us this sense of meaning and grounding that that everything actually makes sense because otherwise it doesn't make sense and it's very confusing and very anxiety inducing. Money doesn't solve human problems. Money solves money problems. And so having money allows you to solve the problems in your life that are solved by money. But most problems aren't really money problems. They're actually human problems. Sometimes those things can't be solved. And when they can, money doesn't help and it can actually hurt sometimes. Love is the solution. I think when it all, when you boil it all down, it's love, it's giving love, it's receiving love. And how do you do that? And are you able to do that? And were you able to do that? I guess that sounds corny, but I think it's true. No, actually, I know it's true. And with that, that's really all I have for this video. So if you related to something that I spoke about in this story, if you're suffering right now, uh, I want you to know that you're not alone, that it's okay to not be okay sometimes, that you can get out of it and it will be better. And it's definitely okay to ask for help because there are people out there who love you and care for you and they can help you. They will help you. If nothing else, just to be there and to to understand and to, to feel with you, um, it's okay to ask those people for help. And if you are fine, great, be happy. Of course, protect your own mental health. It's precious, um, but be kind and compassionate to others. Just remember that we all we're all fighting our inner demons and we don't know what that fight looks like for somebody else. So when in doubt, be kind. If there's someone who you haven't talked to in a while, you don't know if they're doing okay, go ahead, ask them, see how they're doing. That's really all I had for this video. Thanks for watching.